shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But I live, <clears throat> but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I want not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you, all for your furtherance and joy and faith That your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me, by coming to you again. 
Amen. Amen. Well, if you haven't found your place there, go ahead and turn there to Philippians chapter 1. We'll continue our series going through uh, this great book of Philippians. And we're at the familiar passage. If there is a familiar passage in Philippians, there's a few of them. But this one in particular is one that, uh, as we talked about at the beginning of our series several weeks ago, uh, Philippians is just chock full of what we call coffee cup verses, bumper sticker verses. Uh, that you hear and you might see it on a t-shirt or different things, but uh, it's just really just full of some of these uh, verses that we hear, some of these verses that we, we like, but it's not necessarily verses that we always dive deep into. And, and so we're going to look at a passage today that is great and easy and fun to quote, but what really does it mean? When we read that verse, it says, for me to live, Christ, to die is gain. And the verses that go with it, especially where we've been up to this point, what does that mean? And, and so today we're going to look at this idea as you see on the screen. And I don't have a ton of slides for you today, uh, but I do have some scripture I want you to turn with me and look at. If you don't have a Bible, it's probably a black cover Bible there in front of you. Use that with you. But today we're going to look at this, the topic, the idea, really the mission statement that Paul has that he mentions not just in Philippians, but in all of his ministry in life is this, being Christ-centered. But being Christ-centered in life, but also Christ-centered in death. And, and so we're going to look at some things here, and I hope it would be a blessing to you as you not just go out for your week, but it hopefully, as the Word of God should do and can do, is sustain us as we go through the different things that we face. But let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll dive into our passage. Lord, we come to you this morning. And God, we say, great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Lord, as the word says in Revelation, who is worthy? We thank you that, as it says in Revelation 5, and there stood a lamb that was slain, that we can celebrate Jesus Christ who came to earth, lived his life, died on the cross, but as we thank you and praise you for every Sunday, not just Resurrection Sunday. We thank you that you are no longer there. He is risen. And Lord, as we look at your word today, and, and really, God, as we focus on maybe a verse or two that, that we might know, but God, we pray that the word would do what only it can do. Lord, I pray you would penetrate my heart. Lord, I pray you would help us to, to see what you have for us to see. Lord, I just ask that you might just take the veil away on our minds and on our hearts to give us exactly what we need. Thank you for everyone's here today. Lord, I don't know how they might have found their way in this room, but God, I pray that your word would rule and overrule every situation, every thought, especially for the next few moments that the word of God would speak. God, I pray you might take me as your vessel. God, cleanse me of my sin and myself. Lord, that I might be able to say what you have for me to say in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. In 1993, while fishing in St. Mary's Glacier in Colorado, a man by the name of Bill uh, Jaraki uh, was fishing and actually fell in a little bit of a hole while there in the water, and his leg was pinned under a boulder. And he wasn't able to escape, and after many attempts to, uh, to try to free himself uh, from that, he came to the, the, the gruesome faith that there was nobody near him, and he couldn't contact anybody, and, and he couldn't just stay there. And after spending what they believe is six or seven hours, he finally came to the decision in a desperate attempt to survive. He made his flannel shirt a tourniquet, and then he used his fishing knife to sever off part of his leg so that he might be able to escape and to go free. Um, he was did able after that time to kind of crab walk through down to a path and found help and, and later survived, obviously, and was very grateful for that. Ten years later, in 2003, a man by the name of Aaron Ralston had a very similar experience while hiking out west as well. While hiking out west, uh, he slid on some loose gravel or loose rocks and found himself in, in a situation to where he reached up and his hand uh, kind of got buried just enough where he could not remove his hand. He spent 14 hours <coughs> trying to free himself and everything he could do. And when he realized he did not have enough water and enough food, to, uh, to live, to sustain life and being by himself. He made the same similar idea 
and, and took a knife he had in his pocket and, and dismembered himself right above his wrist. He was able to later uh, make the rest of the way down and finding a Dutch family who guided him to a rescue helicopter. Uh, eventually he made it to the hospital and he survived. And he actually, uh, Aaron Ralston wrote an autobiography. He titled this, Between a Rock and a Hard, Pro Hard Place. Very appropriate title. And what do these two stories have in common? You're like, Philip, I want it warm and fuzzy, man. You are not starting warm and fuzzy. Uh, these two stories have some basic things in common. First thing is this, be careful when you go out by yourself out west. I think that'll be the first thing. Right? <laughs> Phone needs to be charged, but you need a buddy system. That was the first thing I took from it, like a no-go by myself, you know what I mean, that kind of stuff. But I think what it shows here is really, as, as human beings, we really have a remarkable tendency and passion and desire to live. To live. We have this tremendous desire to want to live life, right? And, and, and that's a great thing. In fact, when you get to the point, I know there have been many people that have, when you get to the point where life's no longer worth it and life would just be better without, you know, when you get to that place, you get to a scary point in life. <clears throat> that's a very real thing, whether we want to acknowledge that or not. And that's when people need help and that's when we need to, to love on them and help them and they need to get medical attention, all the things that need to be done. But I will say that's a very real thing. But when we see here this through these stories that we will do many things and go through great pains to, to live life, to continue. We'll spend money on the best doctors. We'll even take up uh, discipline eating habits. You know, we'll eat everything that's leafy and green in life and whatever we can do there. And, and we'll move to even particular climates and that, uh, to make sure that we can breathe better and do the other things. We'll, we'll, we'll even, as these guys do, allow ourselves to be dismembered just so we can have the opportunity to live. And the whole world, even several, several years ago, if you remember uh, back in Katrina days, and that just seems like just another lifetime ago, <clears throat> that we will do through horrific events whatever we need to do to survive. But here's the question that I think we must answer. If we all have this innate desire to live life, right? We want to live. Uh, even though Monday's coming, I get that. But, you know, we want to live life. I think the question that we have to answer is this. What do you live life for? You want to live. You know why, you know. I mean, I'm a believer. I know I'm going to heaven. I'm not desiring to go up the next load necessarily in that way, in that aspect. But, you know, what do you live life for in this short life that we have? And, and I know that that theory of being a short life kind of changes when you're a younger person, you're a child and a teenager, you feel like, man, life will never, ever get going for me. It feels like forever that you're that you're young. But when you kind of finally get in your 20s and eventually hit your 30s, it's like, man, life just goes whew, really fast. And some of y'all are laughing going, 20s and 30s, man, what are you talking about? You know, I mean, it just seems like life goes by really fast. And, and, and so in it, we all, we look for life and we love life and we want life. And, and a lot of times we're never content with where we're at in life. And a lot of that goes to what are we living life for? I, I remember, as a, to give you a similar example, when I was a kid, when I was in junior high, man, I wanted to be in high school. Man, I just want to be in high school. When I got in high school, I just wanted to graduate, man. I want to go to college. And when I got to college, man, I just wanted to be in college, and I wanted to graduate. And I even kind of had this mentality, and, and I'll just be a little honest. Some of you may not have this mentality. I was like, Lord, just, just don't let me die or, or don't come back in the rapture, if you would, before I can graduate college and get married. God, if I could just get married and graduate college, man, just, please let me have that, God, before I die or before or the rapture. Please do that. And then, and then I got married. I said, God, if you could at least let me be in ministry of some way to get to all this stuff that I've been excited about, man, if you could let me do that, please don't let me die before that happens. And then uh, we got ministry, got married, and then I was like, God, if you at least let me have kids, God, you know, let me have kids. Don't let me die before I have kids, or don't let the rapture come back. And then God gave me kids, and I'm like, even so, Lord Jesus, come quicker. <laughs> Amen. If I want to be totally honest, I shouldn't say that. My next step was actually this, and I should have said this. And just being honest a little bit. God, let me be a pastor. Amen. God, let me be a pastor. And now it's definitely, even so, Lord Jesus, come with me. Okay? All right? But, but what I want us to see is this. Why do you want to continue on living? That's right. 
What's going to, what got you up this morning? You're like, what? there's a lot of little humans in my house that got me up. I got up because I can't sleep well. I got up because I'm nervous about this in life. But what is it in life? What is it that you're going through? Well, I'm just floating. Well, there are seasons of life that we float. But in reality, what are you living life for? We all desire to live. We all desire life. But what are you living life for? Uh, what will you live for in the rest of your days? There's something I'm coming very close to understanding. There is not a single thing I can do about my past. That's right. Now, if I need to apologize, if I need to make things right, of course I can do those things. There's nothing that I can do about yesterday. But what am I doing about today and tomorrow? What am I living life for? Some of us live so much in our past that we never ever have any hope, we never have any trust, we never have any joy in today. And I'm not saying there's not things we don't deal with in our past. But what I want you to ask yourself is this. No matter how long you live, whether you live to be very, very, very old or, or not. And what I do, I've had the opportunity to do funerals for people in their 90s, and I've, I've done services by the grave of kids that were two and three days old. When we're born, we don't get a memo of how long we have. But we're coming to a very particular part of Scripture, if you're here and you're a believer, that Paul's talking about to live Christ. We say to live is Christ. To die is gain. That's right. But we're not dead yet. You're like, Philip, you keep us in the sermon long. We feel like that's all right. I get it. But what are you going to do with the rest of these days? James says, For what is your life? It is even what I vapor that appears for a little time and then vanisheth away. Vanisheth away. And, and I, we want to look at what are you living life for because the guy that wrote this letter to this church that wrote these verses. Is sitting in a prison cell for doing the very thing that I'm doing right now. For, for sharing the gospel, for proclaiming the gospel. And, and, and I believe what Paul is trying to tell us is there is a life worth living. And there really is a death worth dying. And we'll get to some of those things here. But what we've looked at over this course of time of going through this is that Paul is writing to this church that is made up of people of all different backgrounds, all different likes, dislikes, nationalities, I mean, everything that you could do, they are, they are about as different as different can be. And, and, and I love how you got to verse number 9 through 11 where he even has this prayer for them. Hey, I just pray that with all the love, that your love will grow, that your knowledge will grow, that your discernment will grow, your sincerity will grow. All these things would grow in that. And then as we looked last week, Paul kind of uh, gave his condition of what's going on in verses 12 through 18. He just says, basically, but I would, verse 12, I would that you would understand, brethren, what he said, what had happened was, is what he just told them. What had happened was, and this is my situation, that I'm in jail. And he says, even though I'm in jail, he says, everything that's happened to me has happened for the glory of God, and that it's happened for the right reason, and that God has allowed my circumstances not to be for fear, but my circumstances to ultimately be for joy. And we see some things about that. We talked just for a moment last week, and I'll just share a couple of them with you. We said, what, what are some reasons or, or ways that we can overcome fear in our life? And I don't know if you remember them, but we said the ways that you can get rid of fear of our circumstances, we said, is to believe that Jesus is real. You will never, ever in your life, when your circumstances hit you and overwhelm you, you will never choose joy. You will always choose fear unless you believe in your heart that Jesus is real. And that's more than just singing it in a, in a hymn on Sunday morning. That's right. Believing Jesus is real is very important Sunday morning at 1030. But it's really tested Tuesday at 230. It's really tested when that thing comes in that life. And we also said this, is that, that to, to choose to help get rid of fear in our circumstances is to know and acknowledge that your, my sins are forgiven. Some of us live that, yeah, their sins are forgiven and their sins are forgiven. But do you live under the understanding, the acceptance, and the joy, <coughs> and the joy that your sins are forgiven? We sang as a choir, count your blessing. One of the main blessings, if not the main blessing we all should count, is that if you're in Christ, my sins, your sins are forgiven, and God doesn't hold those against you anymore. Amen. There are going to be a lot of people that do. 
You want to know, by the way, who holds my, my forgiven sins against me the most? Me. So do you. You probably hold your sins against you more than probably any other person. Because you're always talking to yourself, always comparing yourself, always thinking about these different things. But your sins are forgiven. We also said this to get rid of fear. You have to understand that God Almighty is for me and not against me. We went to Romans 8 for a little while with that. Is to understand. And again, we go back to the comparison thing, which is horrible to do. Well, I can definitely see how God is for them. I mean, look how God's blessing them. Look how nice they look in church. I mean, the whole family sits there. They match. They look good. The kids don't talk. Now that that happens, everything is beautiful. The husband and wife walked in singing uh, Kumbaya. I mean, everything looked great with them. And I will go ahead and just crash and burn that world right now. There's not a single couple, married couple in this room, not a single family in this room that's got it all figured out all together. They struggle just like you did. And probably, if we're honest, <coughs> we're sliding in here on two wheels, making threatenings and all kinds of things, and throwing Pop-Tarts behind the seat, saying, you know what, you're... We're going to enjoy church today. We're going to like it or not. Amen. Right? <laughs> now, like, this is a family vacation. You're going to enjoy it whether you want to or not. It's kind of that mentality. Nobody has it all together. God says that he does not play favorites. Amen. There is no respect of persons with God. I don't believe that that's a verse in Scripture. It's actually in the book of James, chapter. God just loves them more. No. no. He doesn't. He's no respecter of persons. The God is for us. And then God is sovereign, right? God is sovereign. That God rules and overrules. And I always pray that he overrules a lot of things going on in my life. But that God is sovereign. That God is in control. There's nothing that ever will happen, has happened, or ever going to come down the pike that God does not know will happen. Here's the thing that blows my mind. There's nothing that God will allow to happen in my life that he knows will not make me more like him. Amen. I just lost my job. There's nothing in your life that God will allow to happen that will make you more like him. I just went through a personal loss. I just went, I went through a relationship. There's nothing in your life that God does not work all things together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Problem is, his purpose don't always match up with my purpose if I'm just being totally honest. But it's ultimately for his glory. And then the fifth thing we see, the reason that we can overcome a circumstance of fear with joy is that glory with him is coming. And remember, as a believer, this is the worst it's ever going to get for us, this life. <coughs> You're like, well, this life's pretty rough. I'm not saying it's not. It's kind of like wedding vows, if you will. Um, you know, we say in wedding vows, so death do us part, and the idea of departing. But when Christ, Christ is to the groom, we are the bride, it is till death brings us closer. You understand what I'm saying? That's why Paul can say, for me to live is Christ and die is gain. Because then I actually be in the presence of the one who loved me and gave himself for me and sustained me and has carried me all the way through. It's kind of the opposite of that, right? And so what I want us to look at and think about this idea of the Christian life, and as we talk about life in general, if you would, I want us to look at this idea of understanding how do we live a Christ-centered life, or what is a Christ-centered life, and ultimately Christ-centered death, what does that look like as we continue to go down through here? And, and this is Paul's heartbeat, if you would, in what he's saying here. And, and while you may not get the full uh, effect of what uh, Paul is saying here, we should get the idea and understanding this wonderful truth. And, and when Paul says this, and we'll go back to some things here in, in just a moment, but the application of this verse it is kind of with this little phrase where he says in verse number 21. So I'm going to talk about verse 21 and jump back and come back a lot. But Paul says this in verse 20, for me, for me. He says that over and over again. So Paul's resolve is that he would live for Christ. And, and by the way, everyone has to fill in that blank personally. Everyone has to fill in that blank personally. And, and, and how would you complete that sentence? For me, living is, you got to put it in fill in the blank. And by the way, you don't have to say it because our life is showing. For you, and you have to fulfill that, fill in that blank. For me, living is, what is it? Is it power? Is it beauty? Is it entertainment? Is it money? Is it pleasure? Is it success? But using the logic of this passage, notice what fills 
the second blank. So for me, living is, Paul says, Christ. And then he says, dying is, and he fills it in. Gain, it's better. It's going to get to be in the presence of Christ. So if you fill in the first one with one of these cheap substitutes, if we all do, if you're filling in your life, if I fill in my life in this sentence and say, for me to live is man's approval. Or for me to live is money. Or for me to live is beauty. Then you have to fill in that second blank with this. Hey, for me to live is being financially successful. Then you have to fill in this blank. To die is to be broke. For me to live is to have possessions. Then to die is to lose it all. That's right. Well, for me to live it is my relationships. Well, to die is to be separated in those relationships, maybe even just for a little while. Well, for me to live is the pleasures of life and, and uh, be entertained. Then to die is the absence of all of those things. For me to live is power, control. Well, to die is to be powerless and without control of anything. You see, we have to understand that. We have to understand what it's saying here. In short, your life is what you live for. What you live for. I'm not asking you if you've been a good person. I'm not asking you if you've been to church a lot. What I'm asking is, what are you living your life for? You're like, I'm a parent. I live my life so my kids will get out of the house and not destroy me or everything that's in it. I get that. There's certain things in life. But to understand, what are you living life for? Well, my life is for entertainment and to die is to have no more fun. Well, my life is just like saying healthy. I'm going to eat every piece of green spinach there is on the planet. Well, and I love, I don't love, I kind of like sometimes eating healthy, but man, the, the Krispy Kreme looks good too. Um, with that, you want to know what manna to probably taste like in the old time? Never mind. Uh, what the idea is this. Don't people that run five miles a day <coughs> and eat leafy green things all day long, don't they get cancer and die too? Yep. Yes. Some of you are like, Phil, I love this. Keep preaching this, man. Okay, I'm not telling you to do it. I'm not telling this that we are just frivolous with our life. But I am saying this. Everyone in this room and everyone on this planet, we have life. We don't know how long that life is. None of us. And this idea of understanding it, if we continue to live, there's a time that we go into eternity. But what are you living life for now? What are you living life for now? Because here's what I found out. I don't get last week back. I don't get a redo. I don't get a redo. So what am I living life for now? Because I'm not going to get those days back. I'm not going to get those minutes back in your life. And in my life, what are we living life for? In short, what will you live for? And you don't want to live merely for possessions or money or our pleasures or beauty or entertainment. By the way, all those things are great gifts of God. May I say that? The Bible does not say money is the root of all evil. It does not say that. It says the love, the pursuit, the idolizing of money, that is the root of evil because you know what it's saying? It's going to drive you. It's, you're going to knock everything and everyone else out of the way for whatever that thing it may be that you want. But the idea of understanding all those things, pleasure, uh, uh, food, everything you can plug in there, uh, find all those things are wonderful gifts of God, but they make crummy gods. <laughs> they make crummy gods, and we make them into idols. They often turn into things that we're we're not going to care about. And, and I don't know if you've ever done this. Have you ever just like worked really, really hard for something? And don't raise your hand. You ever worked really, really hard for something, something you really wanted, and you got it, and now you don't even know where it's at. Like, I got a couple of examples for you today. I got some pictures you're going to love. When I was going into fifth grade, I wanted to be cool, and I worked really hard. And I, every year, my parents would take me uh, school shoe, school shoe shopping. Man, say that <coughs> school shoe, shoe shopping. shopping. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Shoes. All right, that's what we're going for. And I remember going to the mall. Y'all remember those days? Yeah, the mall. Right? Some of them had two stores. 
Okay, you know, all those things. And I remember going to this store and seeing these shoes. And I went to a place, very ancient and old, called Journeys. Okay, I went to that place. And I found, and in my day, a lot of times, especially in elementary, we had these Chuck Taylor All-Stars. You know what I'm talking about? Like the worst shoes. And I got a picture here for you. These were not just Chuck Taylor All-Stars. Because every Chuck Taylor All-Star, what'd you get? You, you had kind of that kind of canvas white color. Uh, you had black, you had red. You might find a yellow or a blue. But when I went into Journeys, I saw those. And that's probably not the best. I'm sorry, I couldn't make a picture better. These were that white color with like paint graffiti splattered on it. Nobody else had them. <laughs> and I remember seeing those, and I wanted those, and I saved my money for those, and I bought those bad boys. And when I walked into Smyrna Elementary, as like a four foot six, 65 pound fifth grader, I was strutting around, the only one that had those kind of shoes. Everybody walked around and went, oh, look what you got. Yeah, check it out. <laughs> can we see them? Yeah, you, can't touch them. you can see them. Someone get too close. Remember, you scuff the little white part right there, and you get mad. Like, white out over it. Anyway, all these things. Those are shoes, man. They were awesome. I love. Them. I cannot tell you today. Probably couldn't tell you 20 years ago where those Chuck Taylors are. But boy, I wanted those things. Another thing I loved, and it's baseball season. I like baseball. Some people don't like baseball. I like it a lot. I remember when I was nine years old. I was going to play baseball before that in my earlier years when I was about five I, I, and six. I got to watch baseball and the first baseball player I ever saw on TV was playing for the New York Mets in 1985, Daryl Strawberry. Okay. Well, my favorite fruit is strawberry. <laughs> so I just took that as a sign from God <laughs> that that's what I should like and who I should like. I know y'all like, you're not a Braves fan. I did not grow up here. We grew up in Tennessee. We didn't even have pro sports teams for a lot of years. Give me a minute. Okay, all right. So we had that. I love strawberry. I love that. The Mets won, the Miracle Mets. Some of y'all remember it. Some of y'all won't earth, and it's okay. And so I remember that. I watched Daryl Strawberry, but I remember when I was nine years old, I loved Daryl Strawberry, and I remember finding into an AG Sporting Goods, and there it was. A strawberry red autograph, even though that means it's printed, Daryl Strawberry Glove. Strawberry red. I was the only one in the baseball league to have a Daryl Strawberry Strawberry Glove. And I kept that sucker pretty much to about 10 years ago, 12 years ago. We put it into a storage. I want to say we put it in storage. I think someone else in my house put it in storage. <laughs> and did not put it in the proper uh, vacuum seal preserve, preservation that it needed. And so anyways, when I went out to see it about 10, 12 years ago, the, the Daryl Strawberry Glove that I kept for all those years had pretty much, uh, it was the wrong part of Matthew 5 where uh, lay up for yourself treasure in heaven when neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. Uh, I got the negative outside of part of that. Uh, the moth and the rust did corrupt it. It was nasty looking. I remember just being broken hearted. But I got rid of it. So I held on to that sucker for a lot of years. Even longer than the Chuck Taylors, which some of you are going to go home and Google. They do still sell them now. But anyhow. But I remember those are some things I wanted. But can I tell you something? And I mean this with as much genuine and love as I can. They're pretty much, pretty much. It's not a thing that you'll chase after today, a possession that won't be in a yard sale or a landfill sometime in the future. That's right. Doesn't mean we can't have nice things. I'm not saying Phil says we gotta be poor broke. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> I love that glove. That glove was awesome. I played ten times better because I had that glove. <laughs> I was gonna pass that glove. I'm sorry, we're gonna pass better than this. We'll keep going. Um, she's in children's trip, she's all right. Um, there's nothing wrong with having things. This problem is when things have you. That's right. And by the way, it don't have to be a physical possession. It can be pleasure. It can be success. It can be whatever you want to plug in there. There's something wrong. So the question today is, what are you living your life for? What are you living your life for? I'm 45 years old. I'm about to be 46 years old here in a couple of months. I don't get to redo 44 <laughs> or 43. I don't get to do that. And 
So what we look at here in understanding is what are we living life for? And I'll walk through part of this passage and, and like I said, hopefully it'll be a blessing to you. There's nothing wrong with those things and, and I love those things and if I find one online, I'll probably buy it, but I am. Um, but I want us to go back because Paul spoke in verses 12 through 18 all about this. He says, here I am in jail. This is my circumstance. I'm in jail and God meant every bit of it for the furthering of the gospel. He actually said that in verse 12, the furtherance of the gospel. He says, so whether I'm in bonds here, whether I'm in prison, whatever it is, he says, guess what? The gospel's going out. I'm getting to tell people about the gospel I wouldn't normally get to. And as I said, Paul's a pretty aggravating cat, man. He really is because if you if you lock him up in jail, he's going to witness to the prison guards. He's going to be looking at the dude and say, oh, Jeremiah, cool, man, you're back. Hey, let's pick up where we left off. Let me tell you some more about Jesus. And, and, and so he started winning the, the guards to, to the Lord. Started winning them to the Lord. So remember just a little while back as we studied the beginning part of Philippians. So you take him and you bind him in prison. What's he going to do at midnight? I'll be sleeping. But you know what he's going to do? He's going to be singing praises to the Lord. Yeah. I will sing of your love. For, I mean, he's just singing it out, man. He's just loving it. You threaten to kill him. He said, to die is game. Because Paul... Not perfect at all. In fact, if you read, and Paul will talk about himself here in a little while, in chapter 3, Paul will talk about how he is the chiefest of sinners. And that's not him just trying to be humble. Paul says, I know who I was. I imprisoned men, women, and children for even going to church. I beat some of them. Paul says, I was a guy that when they took Stephen, one of the first deacons that proclaimed Christ, I held everybody's coat so they could turn around and stone him and kill him right in front of me, and I loved every minute of it. So Paul's not anybody perfect. But he says, because of what Christ has done for me, I know who I was. But thank God that's not who I am now. So I'm going to focus on my life. As long as I live, it's all going to be about Jesus. Only Jesus. That's what my life's going to be focused on. And so when people find out Paul was in prison, when we're reading back in verses 12 through 18, it says some people were preaching Christ and they were doing it out of rivalry or out of envy. They're like, look, Paul here done got in prison. And so they kind of were doing it against him, but they were still presenting the gospel. So Paul says whether they're doing it out of envy or doing it out of strife or contention, he says it doesn't really matter. If they're doing it just to kind of go at me, look at Paul, he can't even stay out of prison doing that. He said, But they're still talking about who Jesus is. He said, that's fine. He says, I'll glory in that. I'll joy in that. And he says, and some are preaching out of love, the gospel. And even all the way back in verse 18, he says, what then, notwithstanding, every way, whether in pretense or in truth, he says, Jesus is being preached. And because of it, he says, I rejoice. I rejoice. <clears throat> but he don't just say, I rejoice, but he says in the next part of the verse, and will rejoice. That's future. We'll get to that in a second. So in verse number 19, as you read this, he says, For I know that this shall turn my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So when we read this and he talks about this idea of I will rejoice, he says, I'm going to rejoice in my present situation, which is being in jail. By the way, not knowing if they're going to allow me to live and go or if they're going to kill me. He says, I'm rejoicing in what's happening about people hearing about Christ. And he says, I will rejoice whether they let me go or... And this is it. He says, I will rejoice in that. And then I love how it goes on to say this and say, well, how can he rejoice? How can that be true? How do you have this Christ-centered life? And, and, and I don't necessarily have the points for the screen for you is this. But here's what I have first is this. He can rejoice. He can live a Christ-centered life by, number one, by relying on Christ completely. You have a Christ-centered life by relying on Christ completely. Because look what he says in verse 19. For I know... That this shall turn to my salvation or my deliverance through your prayer and this through the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Here's what he says, verse 19, Paul speaks of his source of his joy, where he relies on what? He relies on the prayers of the Philippians, these people here to pray for him. These, this church, part of the reason that he's sending them this letter is because he's doing it in response that they were concerned for him. They're like, Paul, we hear you're in prison. We don't know if you're going to die. What's going to happen to you? They even sent a, a gift to him. And this is a dirt poor church. You know what I mean when I say dirt poor? I mean, they had nothing. 
And they sent him food. And they sent him money. Trying to do anything they could to try to help Paul out. And Paul's responding to them. He's saying, I know that my deliverance, I know that my salvation is coming through your prayer. He says, you're praying for me. He said, through your prayer, but also not just your prayer, but through what? Through the sufficiency of what? The Spirit, the Holy Spirit of Christ. He says, I can sit here and say, I rejoice and I will rejoice in my circumstances. And we can have a Christ-centered life and live a Christ-centered way because we rely on Christ completely. Because you know what he says? You're praying for me. He says, but also not only are you praying for me, he says, the Holy Spirit is the one doing the work. The Holy Spirit is the one that is sufficient for this. You know, Job, over in Job chapter 13, verse number 15, he says this. Though he slay me, yet will I praise him. Job, in everything that he went through, he says, even if God takes me out, which if you're Job, everything that he lost, he lost his health as well, everything that you could do, he lost, excuse me. Job had to be looking up going, what's next? Next has got to be me gone, right? But, but God did not take him out. But Job had the mentality. He says, even God, if you, if you kill me, I'm still going to praise you. I'm still going to hope in you. And that's what Paul is saying here. He says, for I know that my deliverance or my salvation is going to be made through you praying for me and the Holy Spirit doing the work. The Holy Spirit doing the work. And, and may I just say this on kind of a side note a little bit. Paul is basically thanking them for praying for him. He says, I thank you. I know God's going to work it out. Now, by the way, he's not saying, I know I'm going to walk through these prison doors. He says, I know I'm going to be delivered whether I get out of here and get to go see you or get to go see Jesus. He says, I'm going to be delivered from my circumstance. If I may very gently say, regardless of your circumstances, whether they last for a moment or the rest of your life, you're in Christ, you will be delivered from them. Whether here on this earth or when you're in the presence of Christ, you will be delivered. It's kind of like the idea of healing. You ever wonder why God allows, especially in Scripture, some people to be healed? Some people never get healed. They deal with their infirmity their whole life. But regardless, whether it's someone that's the blind man that's healed or, or someone like James, that's a disciple that constantly goes around halt or limp. He never can be like the other ones. He couldn't run like John. But regardless, whatever he did in his life, one day he will be healed. He will be delivered. And again, I'm not downplaying your situation. I don't know your situation. Here's what's great. I don't need to know it. You don't want me to know it. God knows it. One day you will be healed. It might not be in this life. It might be. And by the way, it's not just physical healing. Sometimes those are emotional. Sometimes those are mental. Sometimes those are addiction. Sometimes there are various things in our life, sin, struggles, whatever it may be. <coughs> but there will be a healing. There will be deliverance in there. But I love how Paul says here, he said, I'm going to make it through this trial. And you know how I'm going to make it through this trial? And this is what he's telling this church. I'm going to make it through this trial through your prayers. And I'm going to make it through it by the Spirit of God. Never discredit prayer. I feel you knew me the way I knew me. You would tell me that prayer is not worth praying. You ain't praying to me anyway. You ain't praying to you. Prayer is when we submit ourselves to a God who can take care of it. The problem is we don't pray because we still kind of feel like either we can make it work or even God can't make it work. There is no in-between. The reason that you and I do not pray more is because we believe it's too big for God and or too big for us. Or I'm still trying to work it out. I like to do that. But you see here this idea when he says, that's what's going to sustain me. And the Bible says in James chapter 5, verse 16, James reminds us what? That the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man or a righteous woman availeth much. The idea of praying for that. I want to encourage you. 
is a great encouragement to me when I meet people and hey, they feel we're praying for you. And they don't mean it like, hey, how you doing praying for you? Like they actually mean they're praying for me. I tell you, that, that there's no better encouragement you can give somebody than for them to know that you actually are taking time to take them before God and to plead on their behalf. It leads me to this, and I'll jump on it and jump off of it. How much of your prayer life is about anyone other than you and your family? Is your prayer life consistently about you, your family? you got to give us a good day. How much of your prayer life is for other people? What about for those who are your enemies? You say, why are you supposed to pray for men? Let's go back to Matthew. He talks about that a little bit. Pray for your enemies. Love them. I found this out. I will never love those who are against me until I'm willing to pray for those who are against me. That's right. I'm never willing to love them. I'm never willing to do kindness to them until I'm willing to pray for them. And, to, and by the way, I'm talking about, hey, God, you know what's going on. So if you want to do what you do, you know, take, I'm not talking about take them out kind of prayer. There are precatory prayers in the Bible. But I mean, do you pray <laughs> For people other than yourself. Who have you this week? Who have you this morning? Other than just you and your family. Things that directly touch you. That you pray for them. That the Holy Spirit of God will sustain them through their trials. Because that's what this church was doing for the Apostle Paul. Paul, we've heard what you're going through. Paul, we're praying for you. We're going to be diligent to pray for you. And Paul says, I know I'm going to be delivered. I know that my salvation is going to come. Because of the prayer that you have and through the Holy Spirit. And Paul said, that's what sustained me. That's him fully relying on that. you got to keep going. Verse number 20. Paul says, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ." die. It's game. I know we want to run to verse 21, but can I tell you verse 20 is awesome. Okay? Paul just says, here's what my earnest, my, my biggest expectation and my hope, if I can say it like this, he's saying this, here's what my earnest passion, passion and longing is. This is what I have the most passion about. This is what I'm longing for in my life, that in nothing I shall be ashamed. That in nothing, in the way that I live this life, I shall be ashamed. And if I die, I'm not going to be ashamed because of the way I live my life. That in nothing that I should be ashamed, but that in all boldness and all going forward courageously, he says this, in this, if you underline things in your Bible, this is ultimately what Christ-centered life is. He says this, is that Christ shall be magnified in my life, in my body. He said, that's, that's it. That's my motto. So if you want to say, for me to live as Christ, what's the answer to that? Is that Christ would be magnified in your life. And if Christ is magnified, if Christ is made beautiful, he says, you know what? i got nothing to be ashamed of. The problem is there's a lot I'm ashamed of in my life. But it ain't about the times I magnify Christ, the times when I magnify myself or something else or someone else that I was chasing. But he says, this is my passion. This is my longing. This is my hope. That I don't want to be ashamed. I, I can have boldness in my living my life. Why? Because my passion is I want Christ to be found. <clears throat> he said, so if I'm sitting there in Philippi preaching a sermon to you guys. And everything is going good and we're about to have dinner on the grounds afterwards. Christ be magnified. Or if I'm sitting in a prison cell. Not necessarily knowing if I'm going to make it out of here. I want Christ to be magnified. The problem is, I'm totally honest, it does not take much to get us off that, that rail. We wake up in the morning, I want to please God with my life. And one little thing happens here. One little thing happens here. And we're so much trying to get our make everything about us and to give us happiness and give us peace and all that stuff. We never get back on the rail of the idea of, does this magnify Christ or does this magnify me? Every human being in this room, for the rest of the day, if God allows you to live, and I hope we all get to live a long time, when you walk out this door, you're going to live, you're going to act, think, and pursue things that either magnify you or magnify Christ. It's, it's that simple. See, I'm from Tennessee, right? Tennessee, we got to keep this stuff simple, man. All right? Keep it simple. You know how that works. Okay, so the idea is that. And here's what Paul says. 
You want to live Christ. You want Christ to be the center of your life. You want the glory to truly go to Christ, which we all sing about and talk about. He says, magnify Christ in your life. Magnify Christ. Whatever you do. 1 Corinthians 10.31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all for yourself. No, it's not what it says. Do all for the glory of God. The same way Paul says this repeatedly in the New Testament. Magnify Jesus. Magnify Jesus. Don't magnify yourself. <coughs> and the problem is, we, I say we, we get so caught up in the appearances and the things that we feel like give us joy. And if we're honest, it's just as hollow as that chocolate Easter bunny we gave our kids. The outside looks great, but on the inside it falls apart and it's hollow. What are you seeking to magnify? Let me ask you a question. What's wrong today? Like, what do you mean? More than likely, there's something that's kind of gnawing at you a little bit today. Now, whatever it is that's gnawing at you, that's pulled on you, is it possible? And I'm not saying that this, this is easy to do. Is it possible that that thing that is gnawing at you is not going the way you want it to go? And it's not magnifying you. But let me ask the flip side of that. Is it possible that that thing in your life could still somehow magnify Christ? Is it possible? You say, no, it's not possible it magnifies Christ. And you don't believe Philippians 1.21. Everything in your life can magnify Christ. I ain't saying it'll take a lot of work. Don't tell you, you might not have to be eating a lot of stuff. There's a lot of times in life i got to eat stuff. And I ain't talking about physically eating. Eat stuff that you know what i got to own stuff. By the way, good rule of principle. Own everything that you can own and a little bit more. It makes life go a lot better. But this idea, he says, I want to magnify Christ in my life, in my body. And he says, whether that be by life or whether it be by death. He says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Now let me jump on the fun part there. To die is gain. How can you say that? How can you even say for a moment to die is gain? Well, we're not sitting in a prison cell either. Okay, I get that. But Paul's not saying my circumstance is so bad that if I died, then you know what, everything would be good. No, what Paul is saying is this. The idea is that right now, I know the Holy Spirit sustaining me and carrying me. There's going to be a day that when I leave this earth, I'm going to be in the presence of God. That's what the gain is. The gain is not, this is a great byproduct. The gain is not no longer circumstances, people, pressure, problems, pain. All of, That's not, the lack of that is not the goal. He said the goal is this. The reason it's better is because I get to be in the presence of God. Now, if I can be honest with you, you let me love on you and lean on you for a second. If the idea of being in the presence of God does not excite you at all, you're not trying to magnify Christ. You're magnifying yourself. That's right. You really probably need to ask yourself the question, what are you living your life for? As I said, I'm 45. I'm pretty sure I just want to be on whole nine right about now. Hold 45 more. I got it. Okay? I'm not looking to go. But it ought to not be a reluctancy and don't even think about that. Because what I got to do here? No, the idea is this. For me to live is to magnify Christ. But when I'm done with this, I get to be with Him. I get to be with Him. And that should bring joy to your life. If the idea of being in the presence of Christ does not bring joy to your life, you might want to consider asking yourself, what are you living life for? Doesn't mean we don't enjoy the stuff here, right? I'm not saying that. Don't, don't, be, a, don't be an extreme, right? It's all about dying or it's all about living. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying Paul does eventually say, I find in what sort of state I am there would be content. So if I'm going to go be with Jesus, I'm content with that. But if I'm here on this life, I'm content with that too. And there's so many verses we won't necessarily take time to look for today. The 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 10 talks so much about the idea of being present with Christ. 1 Corinthians 15. Verses 53 through 58 says for the believer, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And you know what he says? As believers in Christ, when Christ rose from that grave, there is no more sting of death. 
because it's to them brings us together, right? It's to bring us together. And so think about those things in your life. And, and as we wrap up here, I want to, I do want to show you, for me to live as Christ, well, how, give me more on that field. Great, thanks for asking, verse 20. <laughs> but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I want not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And, and having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for the furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. So what Paul is saying here, well, if I get to go be with Jesus, and it's kind of like that rock in a hard place. I don't know if you caught that in verse 23. He said, I'm kind of in this rock in a hard place. He said, because I'm kind of stuck because to my heart's desire is what? I'd rather just go be with Jesus, right? I'd go be with him. He said, which is far better. He said, but nevertheless, it's more needful for you that I stay. That's huge. By the way, don't miss that. So there's two parts here that you see in this living, for me to live as Christ. It's verse 22 where he says, but I will live in the flesh. This is the fruit of my labor. He says, so if I'm going to live this life, I need to bear fruit. I need to bear fruit for Christ. By the way, you see that word fruit. If you look back over in verse number 9 of chapter 1, it says, and this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may with be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Verse 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory of God. He says, if I'm going to live, I want to live a life that bears fruit, that brings glory to God, right? That's what I want to do. I want to live a life that bears fruit. There's so many verses we could talk about that. You can see in this passage, we could do a whole series on this, but we're not going to. We're going to keep going. He says, but the idea of this is bearing fruit. Let me ask you a question. What kind of fruit did you bear this week? Did it magnify Christ? Show how good you are. Did you bear fruit? Because what is the fruit we're supposed to bear? The fruit of, back in verse 11, of righteousness. And it's not my righteousness, it's the righteousness of Christ. Paul goes on for time, we have to do this. He says, Paul says in verse 24, he says, even though I would love to go be with Jesus, which is far better, he said, it is more needful for you. So for me to live as Christ, is to bear fruit and magnify Christ. But another way that we can magnify Christ is this. Serve and live for others. That is a terminology that is so odd in the culture we live in today. To live and serve others. To live for others. Paul just says here, it's a lot better if I just went on out of here. <laughs> he said, but it's more needful for you, Philippians. For you. And here's why, verse 25. And I have this confidence, I know that if I shall abide, if I shall live, I want to continue with you all for what? Your, not his, your furtherance and joy of faith. That word furtherance has the idea of this, your progress. He says, it is better that I don't die, that I continue to live, because part of the way I can magnify Christ in my life is this, is that ultimately I can try to help you continue with you for your progress in the Christian life, and your joy of faith. That's what he says. The idea of the progress of that. Let me ask you, who are you helping in their life progress <coughs> in faith? Don't get me wrong. There's times in life we got to heal. There's times in life we got to sit back, and we got to be fed, and we got to be worked on. There's total times for that. But let me ask you, who are you helping further progress in their faith? In their faith, I will put it to you as plain as I can. If the only furtherance and growth in their faith that I do for my children is what I do on Sunday mornings, I have failed my children. If the only help I give them in the faith is what they hear from me on Sunday morning, I have horribly failed. I need to help them on Mondays. I need to help them on Thursdays. I need to help them every day in between. I need to help them. <laughs> For whose benefit? Not for my benefit, but for their benefit. And that's what Paul's saying. It is more needful. It's more needful. So I want to help meet their need for the furtherance, for their growth in the faith. But not just their growth in the faith, but also what it's saying, their joy. 
their joy of faith. I want to help them for their joy. And that's why he says in verse 26 that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ. For by me and by my coming of you. Our time's gone. Peter is one of those people in scripture that you just got to love. Do you remember Peter denied Jesus three times, right? Second, especially the third time, was pretty bad. Like, cursed, blasphemed God. Okay, we, we try to make, paint that a little bit. It's pretty bad how he denied him. Do you remember in John 21 when Jesus <coughs> reconciles with Peter? He asked Peter that same question three times. Peter, you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. Imagine getting frustrated with Jesus asking him questions. Anyway, I just find that stuff interesting. Lord, you know all things. You know what I mean? What did Jesus answer every time? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. You know what he's telling Peter? If you really want to show me that you love me, love other people. Amen. Serve other people. Jesus even says himself earlier in the gospel, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples by your love one of another. So we want to live a Christ-centered life, which ultimately leads to a Christ-centered death. Then we need to fully rely on Christ. We need to be bearing fruit. We need to be serving other people. Because that's why Paul could say in verse 20, that's my longing and my desire, my expectation. Why? Because I want to magnify Christ. My father-in-law used to say this, and I shared it last Sunday night. I know it's weird to talk about death. I mean, I get that. But he, he said something very interesting that he would always repeat. And like I said, if you're here Sunday night, you heard me talk about it. We were walking through some stuff in Philippians. When he preached, and especially when he always tried to center everything on Christ, and, and, and living your life, living a Christ-centered life, he, he would say this. Of course, now he's home with Christ. He says, live your life in such a way that when it comes time to die, all you got to do is die. Live your life in such a way that when it comes time for you to die, all you got to do is die. You don't need 15 more minutes. You don't need two more phone calls. He said, that's what the Christ-centered life is. And I am not there. <laughs> that's why I love Philippians 3. I press toward Paul says 30 years into this thing. I still got more to I think. And I know it's overwhelming to think in my life, do I love and serve others? Do I bear good fruit? Am I magnifying Christ in my life? Am I praying for others? But can I tell you something, brother and sister, it's got to start somewhere. It's got to start somewhere. Because that's a lie of Satan. You know what? You ain't never going to be all that, so might as well not even start the way to start living a life that pleases Christ is to live a life that pleases Christ today. Start today. I'm going to mess up. Great. His mercy is new every morning. Start today. So at the end of that day, and the end of all your days, you can look back and say, for me to live is Christ. Let's stand together. Father, I thank you for allowing us to be together today. I thank you for this passage of Scripture, Lord. It's common, but yet difficult it is. Lord, honestly, I'm, I'm not looking at death. <coughs> I don't fear it. But God, I just thank you that, that you give us life. But Lord, may we in our lives, Lord, I know I get so caught up in my routine and even good things. But God, I pray you would help us all to live lives that are centered on Christ, that magnify Christ, that what are we living for? I pray you help us in Christ's name. Amen. If you don't mind with your heads bowed and eyes closed just for a moment. I'm going to give you a moment there and some reflection and prayer before we get dismissed. But maybe you just need to go back to that first question. What are you living for? Maybe it's the question we ask. My life is, and you fill in the blank. To understand, whatever you fill that blank in is, you're going to be able to also respond that, that dying is that. If it's anything but Christ, there's a loss there.
appreciate you being here today. Um, and uh, I'll tell you, talking about this stuff is is needful. And I want to encourage you, especially if you are new or visiting with us. The thing about the church is this: none of us have this thing figured out. We all mess up daily. But the wonderful thing about it is that God gives us brothers and sisters in Christ to help bear each other's burdens. No one's got it figured out. I just pray, and I pray for you, and I pray for myself the same way, that when we do mess up, we just start back over. The Bible says the just men fall seven times and get it up, get up again. It doesn't mean they don't fall. It just means they get back up. May Christ help us with that. And may we help each other with that. We're going to sing a going home song. And originally, I had two verses now, but let's just sing the first verses. 481 is just as I am. It's a good uh, invitation hymn. I think it's a good prayer that we could just sing and pray as we are dismissed today. But just the first verse, 41, just as I am. <coughs> Thank you.